On this episode, we're going to talk about some tips and tricks to make your job a little bit easier when it comes to the administration portion of doing your cable job. Welcome to the show where we tackle the tough questions submitted by installers, estimators, project managers, even IT personnel, sometimes even customers. We are connecting at the human level so that we can connect the world. If you're watching this show on YouTube, would you mind hitting the subscribe button and the bell button to be notified when new content is being produced? If you're listening to us on one of the audio platforms, would you mind giving us a five-star rating? Those two little steps helps us take on the algorithm, which helps us get this message out to help educate, encourage, and enrich the lives of more people in the industry. Thursday night, 6 p.m., what are you doing? I do a live stream on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, TikTok, uh, trying to get the Instagram as soon as they, my platform service fixes it. So you can learn more about the ICT industry. You can submit your favorite questions to your RCDD. That would be me. And I answer them live on stream. But I can hear you now. Chuck, I'm driving the truck at 6.30 p.m. I can't, I can't be watching a video. I might get in an accident. They're recorded. And you can watch them on our website at letstalkcabling.com. So there's no excuse to missing them. Also, while this show is free and will always remain free, if you would like to support this show, click on the QR code on the screen right now where you can buy me a cup of coffee. You can even schedule a 15-minute one-on-one call with me after hours, of course. And we're also accepting corporate sponsors. So if your cor company's organization lines up with Educate, Encourage, and Rich, shoot me an email and we will have a conversation. As an installer out in the field, you're always looking for a way to make your job a little bit easier. Well, if you're smart, you are. I know I was always looking for a way to make my job a little bit easier because I didn't like to work too hard. I like to work with my brains. So one of the areas that's commonly overlooked is when it comes to labeling. One of the age old conversations that you're gonna hear is, should I use a, a machine generated label? Can I use a Sharpie? Or no, I don't even label at all. I just pull everything and tone it out. Well, we're gonna have a conversation about that. And you know me, I always bring in a subject matter expert. Now today's subject matter expert is actually on my expert council. And he's been a part of, a member of the show for a long, long time. And I'm bringing him on because of two reasons, one, he has a lot of experience as a contractor, which I'll have him explain here in a minute. And two, he also works for a labeling company. So he, he can help us look at both sides of this issue. So everybody, welcome Todd Morse for back to the show yet again. <laughs> Hi, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, brother man. Um, good, right, good. For those who may, I've gotten a lot of listeners since the last time you've been a guest on the show. So why don't you take the 30 second spiel and tell us who you are and, and why. Our, our, our audience should listen to you. Well, I, I, I really can't tell them why they should listen to me. I mean, uh, <laughs> they should listen to me because of you, number one. So, um, so uh, Todd Morse, uh, Brother Mobile Solutions. And uh, as, as Chuck, I also uh, have a little web series called BS with Todd. And uh, on BS with Todd, we talk about labeling and everything affiliated with labeling. So, you know, it could be the standards. Uh, it could be uh, partners. It could be asset management, uh, anything to do with low voltage uh, and electrical. So um, every two, every other Thursday uh, on YouTube, and I don't even know the name of the damn channel, uh, because like like you said in the beginning, I always, I always have a helper in the background, and uh, Kate is not with me today, so I'm doing this solo. So anyway, uh, if you go to YouTube, just uh, type in BS with Todd, and there's 70 episodes now. 70 episodes. So I started this uh, during COVID when I thought, uh, oh, you know, crap, what am I going to do now? I'm not able to travel. And uh, it might as well teach this way and what a fantastic platform it has been. And you know, there's there's uh, been some great partnerships, uh, partnered with Chuck uh, and some other folks out there, and uh, it's done quite well. So you mentioned, uh, uh, Chuck, the contractor world. So I've really done everything in this business that there is to do. I started off as a contractor in Texas. And uh, built that business, a uh, pretty good sized business. And uh, then I ended up getting tired of doing that 
and I went to work for a manufacturer's rep uh, firm out there, which uh, not to be named here. Uh, and then I went to work for a, um, a distributor. Uh, and I, I got uh, two years of experience um, outside sales uh, doing that. Um, and now I'm with a manufacturer. But uh, as far as a contractor, one of the things uh, that I did was labeling. And um, I was not a fan of labeling uh, then. Um, I'm really not a fan of labeling now. It's one of those little intricate pieces that has to be done. And you're talking to a guy that really doesn't have any patience. But um, I think that that makes me pretty successful, Chuck. And, and you know, knowing the pains uh, that these folks are having with labeling. And, and I can clearly remember when we're roughing in uh, using Sharpies and using the, the white uh, tape if you will, in, in writing uh, and, and using the little flippy books. I call them the flippy books. They're, yep. uh, you know, A through Z and, and, and zero through nine, right? And taking one on. I hated uh, those things. Oh, man. Oh, they, still, they still sell them. They still I sell them. Either. Oh, no, absolutely. And you know what? They're, they're um, relatively expensive. And so anyway, um, I talk for a lot of things and against a lot of things. But the, at the end of the day, your job needs to comply with the standards. And that's uh, what I do is I uh, teach the standards and, and I'm all about the standards. And, and uh, uh, so if you got any questions on that, certainly reach out. But um, anyway, that, that's kind of my background, uh, Chuck. And, well, and I, uh, that, man. I kept and that under 50 minutes. Yeah. And that's why, that's why I brought you on because you have such a, you're like me, you're, you're, you're a jack of all trades, right? You've done a little really? bit of everything. And that's really? why I think your opinion is one that's valued and that the audience should listen to because you've, okay. you're not just out there selling labeling machines, right? You were a contractor. You were out there doing the work, paying your guys to do the work, managing all that, tracking all the monies, and looking for ways to make yourself more efficient so you can have more revenue at the end of the day. Right? So that's why, that's why I brought you on. Thank you. Yep. Now, here's one question I want you to wax poetic on, right? Because, you know, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on social media, all the social media platforms. And there are a couple subjects that you can throw out there that will immediately start a heated debate. <laughs> and and one up. of them comes to, with labeling, right? Uh -huh. You know, well, should I label it machine generate labels? No, I just use Sharpies, you know, or no, I just, I just pull cable and tone it out. <laughs> Which do you think is, is faster, labeling well, not labeling and turning it afterwards, Sharpies, or using a, a printed labeling machine? You know, I, I got to tell you from experience. So we had this as a contractor, this big job in uh, William Square. It's in Irving, Texas. And uh, it was for TIG Insurance. I don't think they're around anymore. But uh, nonetheless, is uh, there were several thousand uh, cables to be pulled. And uh, my business partner at the time said, you know what? We're going to try something new. We're going to rough everything in. And then we're going to tone and tag. And I got to tell you that uh, I lost so much money on that job. It was absolutely uh, incredible. And so I can tell you, if you're out there roughing in and then toning after, um, that's one of the dumbest things you can do. All right. And, and being, <laughs> you know, I don't have a filter, Chuck. So, um, you know, as, as far as uh, the Sharpies, um, I, I get on TikTok every now and then. I, I take a look at some of the posts that uh, these these uh, low voltage folks are making, and there was a discussion that came up about labeling. And uh, the, the one guy chimed in and said, "I still use a sharpie. I still use a sharpie." Well, I tell you what, um, that's probably not the guy. If you're an end user that you want to hire, right? Um, the whole idea behind labeling is that if you look at the standards, it says that the, the, the labels must be machine generated. OK, um, if you're still using a Sharpie to rough in. Right. That's fine. But what if a guy like me. Right. <laughs> is, is 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 making those marks on the rough end. All right. <clears throat> it means that the guy coming behind me you know, is going to see nothing but a bunch of scribbles. And I'm telling you that that's it. It happens. It happens. Yeah. So then what happens if you can't read it, then you're in a tone and tag situation. Yep. So yeah. why not do everything right the first time, the first time? And and I love the one and done, you know, whether it's, it's, you know, uh, uh, roughing in the cable, whether you're grooming the cable, 
uh, whether you're terminating or labeling, one and done, get in, get out. So again, if uh, I highly recommend utilizing labeling on the rough end, and if you use the right label for rough end, that label's not going to come up in the ceiling or in the conduit. Or yeah, we're going to talk about that more in a minute. Okay, good. Thank you. Minute, Thank so. you, because that's, that's um, a, but, very important. So you 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 did the uh, you know the thing about your handshaking. You know, you don't want you you don't want you labeling the labels. You don't want me labeling them either because uh, Chuck is blind as a bat, right? <laughs> and and here's the thing, especially like you know the number the number six and the number nine. You better know which way they were writing those numbers. Because oh, I know, <laughs> right? I know, I know. But, trust so, me. I mean, if you look at the, the fonts, the fonts on our iPhone, Chuck, I'll bet you we use the same fonts. I bet you we right? do. I bet you we do. Right? So it's the same so, with the labeling. Is you you have to have something that is large enough to see and is clear and concise. And again, if you follow the standards, um, you you don't have to put you know three lines of of characters on a label. It's very easy right. to do if you follow the standards. Right. Well, it, yeah, I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna do a one hour. I'm trying to figure out if I want to do like an Eventbrite or whatever. I'm gonna get it registered by Bixie for CECs. I'm gonna do a one hour show on codes versus standards versus best practices because most people don't know the difference between those three, and that's a whole you know. So I'm gonna do a whole CEC thing on that, and I'm gonna get that out there because it's a big. Conversation. So I'm going to ask you your preference of opinion in a second, but mine would be to some type of labeling system versus the no label. Because you mentioned the no label and towing it out takes more time, but you didn't mention, I'm surprised you didn't. When you try to dress out cables that haven't been labeled, they never end up, you got one or two things. You end up with a really beautiful comb dress in the telecom room, but then in one room, you've got four drops and it's number one, number 85, number six, number 13. Or if you go by one, two, three, four, then you got a mess in the closet. That's the problem with with uh, not labeling and toning. So well, that's obviously the reason. Labeling. That's the reason why we we basically lost our ass on that job, Chuck. Is that you know we had everything coming in, um, and it was coming um, you know from from both areas. It was coming through a raised floor environment up, and then it was coming from a racking system down. And you're absolutely right. Is that uh, you, you end up with a spaghetti Western, right? It, it all looks like this. Yeah. And, you know, we had to redress almost every cable in there. And that's why we, we lost a fortune. Um, that one particular instance uh, cost us a lot of money. And as a contractor in a tight wad, uh, I wasn't too happy about that. So thank you for bringing that up. Right. <laughs> I like rubbing salt in the wound there, brother. You know that. Um <laughs> So, you know, the next thing I want to kind of point out, too, is is um, with Sharpies. I already, we already mentioned the sloppy handwriting. We already mentioned being blind as a bat. Mm -hmm. But I, I, could, I could not tell you how many times I pulled a bundle of cables through a ceiling. And because they're rubbing against other cables or rubbing against the grid or, or transitioning out of thing, the letters get rubbed. Not, maybe not necessarily all the way off, but to the point where you don't know what the number is. Right. So Absolutely. So why would that not be an issue with a machine generated labeler? So let, let's go back to the Sharpie thing. I, I think within um, the realm of, of pulling cable from an installation standpoint, it's okay to use the Sharpie to mark the box, the cardboard box, right? There's no, you, you have to right. do that, right? right? I think it'd be ridiculous if you'd use labels to do what you can use a Sharpie with on the actual boxes uh, when you're doing the rough in. Um, you know, regarding the Sharpie and what you said, ab absolutely, you know, it, it does come off. And again, if, if, if you're pulling in a bundle and let's say three or four of, of those uh, cables, um, you can't be read. Well, again, now you're talking about taking time to tone those out and you don't want to tone anything out. So the benefit of using a machine generated label and, you know, brother has a, a lot of products, obviously been around for a long time but one of the things that makes us uh, who we are in this industry and the reason why i recommend using our labels um during rough in is that everything every label we have right is laminated which means it's scratch resistant scuff resistant water resistant oil resistant 
uh, you know, rated up to 225 degrees and 80 below zero. So keep in mind is that when you have that bundle going through the ceiling and everything's rubbing, uh, those labels aren't going to come off. The way that you have to take those labels off, if you're using the right label, is you have to physically remove it. So I highly, highly, highly recommend using machine-generated labels versus a Sharpie on the rough-in stage. I hope that I'm answers glad you pointed out. I'm glad you pointed out using the right label because there was a, a social media post. What was it, about two weeks ago or so? Maybe? Yeah, I don't know. Weeks. I had vacations. I'm, I'm, having, I'm still on vacation brain fog. And somebody said that they didn't like using labels because of the peeling up thing. Matter of fact, I tagged you on it and stuff. Well, yeah, I, I saw the post and and yeah, uh, yeah. So why don't yeah. you talk for a few seconds about selecting the right kind of cartridge for your printer? Yeah, so yeah, yeah, open. yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, I, I I politely responded to this individual, and he was singing uh, one of my competitors' praises, and and that's fine. I don't care who you're using, as long as it's a machine-generated label. I prefer you use my uh, merchandise, right? my platform. Uh, but again, he was singing the praises about this other manufacturer. And the good thing is he's labeling, but, uh, but he was way, way, way off base uh, right from the get-go. And Brother has a couple of different types of tapes. All right, We have a tape that is meant for a smooth, flat surface. All right? So... Um, let's say that patch you have panel? a patch panel, the patch panel, the rack. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say smooth and fat. I said smooth and flat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, where was I? Oh, so uh, there's a couple different types of labels, right? A regular TZE tape is meant for a smooth, flat surface, right? If you have a porous surface, uh, let's say something's been powder coated, or let's say you want to label a cinder block wall or the tire on your truck, even. All right. And I have a video last uh, last week's video was was interesting as I actually put labels on the tire tread of my truck, drove down a dirt road, drove three miles to a car wash, drove my truck through the car wash and every single label, including the tread, was still there. Now, the reason why it stayed on there is a wheel is wet round. OK. And so I used our TZE FX tape, which is meant for round or curved surfaces. So anyway, um, if you use the right label, it's not going to come off until you peel it off. So TZE for smooth, flat surfaces, we have an extra strength tape. That extra strength tape, again, is going to be for that cinder block wall or that powder coated rack. And it's got a softer adhesive that gets inside those nooks and crannies, if you will. Um, so use the right label for the job. And if you have any questions, please reach out to either one of us. Um, but again, if, if, if the folks out there don't have this knowledge and all of a sudden they're using a tape that is meant for a smooth, flat surface, all right, you take that and it has a memory for a flat surface, but you take it and you put it around something round. Well, it wants to go flat, right? And so it delaminates, right? So again, if you use our FX tape, TZE FX around cables, uh, wires, conduit, it's not going to come off. And that's so, my whole point there is make sure that you choose the right kind of tape. It's not just a matter of going out and buying a cartridge. You got to pay attention. You got to know what you're labeling on, right, to choose the right kind of cartridge for that. Every manufacturer has that. So it's not just Brother that has a certain right. tape for a cable wrap. Every manufacturer has that. And I've been guilty of using the wrong tape uh, when I was a fledgling in the industry. And the problem with that is that it's on my dime to go back there Right. and relabel everything that has fallen off the cables or the patch panels or the racks or you name it. So I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to have that situation on my dime and to avoid that for you, uh, use the right tape for the application. Right. You know, one of the, one of the steps, one of the tricks that we used to use is we used to have one of those um, printer machines that would print off all the labels for the job before the job began. We'd walk out, not, not with the book, but literally with like, you know, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper with, with right. labels on there and stuff. Right. And I know yep. that you guys have a, a, a job machine label like that as well. As an installer in the field, how do you deal with, uh, with like maybe example, maybe a, 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 one of the numbers was missed because somebody was dyslexic or, or maybe one of the labels was done wrong in the field and you only have that book to work with. Well, so, you know, going back to when I was a contractor, if you pre-print everything, right, 
that that job is being printed from an Excel spreadsheet, let's say. So somebody in the office has done an Excel spreadsheet, but let's say there's human error, right? And you, you take that manila folder out to the job site. And this happened to me so many times. If I had a nickel for every wrong label that I had as a contractor, Chuck, I wouldn't be doing this at my age, right? No, so we, anyway. You and, I both, you and I both would be uh, riding our motorcycles on some nice, yeah, nice yeah. wilderness road right now. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so uh, what, 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 what I would do is I'd pre-print everything. You take it out to the field, right? And the boys and girls are out there and they're labeling everything based upon the pre-printed eight and a half by 11s we gave them, right? So they get halfway through this seven by 19, you know, fully equipped rack and uh, it's time for certification. So they start certifying. And in the old days, you know, with Fluke, with the DSPs, you'd have a walkie talkie on one end and a walkie talkie in the closet and you're calling out port numbers. Well, all of a sudden, those the, the the guy on the end is is in a different port, right? Than you have on the patch panel. So you discover there was human error. So what happens at that point is all the labeling from that mess up down. And there's a term I'm not going to use for that. Uh, it's on one of my shows. But anyway, all that labeling has to come back off, and it has yep. to be relabeled. But guess what? You don't have those on site. You don't have those printers on site. So what has to happen is a reprint. So now you're talking time and money to reprint that um, and, and, and correct it. Let's hypothetically say that uh, they catch it in time, right? Before the testing, before the certification, you're not going to have uh, that one label on that sheet. You've already used it. It was a wrong label, right? right? So one of the things that Brother does, and, and I love, 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 love this feature, is that you have the opportunity to take that same spreadsheet that you would print on that eight and a half by 11. And you can send your tech that spreadsheet. That tech then takes his phone, right? Connects it to the machine and downloads that database. Could be 10,000 labels, 20,000 labels. It doesn't matter. The whole idea behind that is that that tech is looking at everything that he's printing uh, on the spot. And if there is a mistake that, that happens within that Excel spreadsheet, that tech can fix that immediately versus waiting for travel time and reprint time and so forth and whatnot. And at the end of the day, Chuck, I'm telling you, is that these little mistakes, right, that are generally discovered during certification can cost lots and lots and lots of money. Well, lots of money, yeah. Because it's it's the rework that costs money because that <sighs> stuff was never estimated in the project. Nope. So now that, that's being done on the company's dime. Now, a lot of installers Correct. may not really think too much about that because – their installers or technicians and stuff, but the profitability of that project is based on only doing what was estimated. And if you're doing more stuff that was estimated, well, now you're taking more time. That wasn't in the bid. That means potentially that project didn't make any didn't make any money. And you get no, another I project that don't make money, you go out of business. You're you as an installer lose a job. Sure. Absolutely. And, and, you know, labeling when, when you're doing a takeoff and I still see this, right. Cause I'm, I'm out and about. And in fact, last week I made some sales calls with my local rep here. Um, but I always ask is that, you know, how do you factor labeling into these big jobs? And most of the time they say, well, we just, we guesstimate, which <laughs> again, I'm a, I'm a tight wad. I'm a tight wad. And that guesstimation word, whoo, no, 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 no. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm also there to educate. And basically what they do is they view it as uh, ancillary. You know, it's an ancillary part of that yeah. project. And they're guessing. It's under the, uh, it's under the miscellaneous fund. Miscellaneous. And yeah. you know what? A lot of times they don't factor in because mistakes are going to happen in labeling. But you need to factor and put a little fudge in there for some of the mistakes. And, and I highly recommend knowing what each label is costing you. All right. And, and uh, yeah, do the research with the, the different manufacturers and, and do some, uh, uh, do some estimates. But I would, if I were doing a takeoff um, at my old age right now, I would do the same thing that I did 25, 30 years ago is that I would estimate a hard estimate on labeling what every label is costing me, what the labor is costing me, 
all right, mm-hmm. what the office supplies are costing to print those, mm-hmm. because we printed on the eight and a half by 11 on an inkjet, all right? Yep. And so uh, I, I would highly recommend uh, doing a, uh, uh, some due diligence on what that labeling is actually, uh, excuse me, actually is going to cost you. Yeah, I, I, what I did with mine when I was an estimator is I actually, I priced in four sets of labels, right? Mm-hmm. One for each side for insulation, one for each side for post installation, mm-hmm. and then the materials. And then I made up a fake part number. And then I reached out to my manufacturer and said, how much is a, how much is a box of tape? How much, right. how, you know, you know, um, how much, how much extra tape was inside of it? And I figured, okay, well, if there, if it took X amount of space underneath of a, of a port on a panel, well, then I, one, one panel will burn up X amount of cartridges. So I, I can come up with, and we'll talk more about this here in a second, you know, how much that price was. And I just, so I just, uh, if I knew I had 500 cables, it was a simple 500 units yeah. times that pre fake part number that I came up with that I, <laughs> I know, right? I, but I, st- I will argue with you all day long that an estimate is nothing but a guesstimate. You can go, you can do your due diligence and you can be as accurate as you want, but every estimate has a mistake in it. Sure it does. And, but the whole idea is to, mig- uh, to, to mitigate, you know, those mistakes. And again, I go back as a, a uh, an owner, uh, low voltage uh, contractor owner. Uh, I wanted every nickel I could, man. And you know what? So, uh, and you're absolutely right. Mistakes are going to happen and delays are going to happen and, yep. you know, so forth and whatnot. But, um, you know, uh, labeling should not be miscellaneous or ancillary. Right. Please yeah. do your due diligence. And, you know, it's part of the job. And hopefully the, it makes money. Off of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The miscellaneous is for the, the unknowns. Right. You know how many labels you're going to need. That's easy to calculate. Correct. It's not that big of a deal. Let's talk about post installation, right? Since you mentioned that uh, you do ANSI standards uh, uh, webinars, and I think you're even on the committee for the ANSI standards, aren't you? Correct. Okay, I, th- I thought you were. So let's talk post installation. The installers, you know, they finished pulling the cable, finished testing. What all components? Now remember, this is a this is a ICT structured cable job. What all components, in your opinion, should be labeled? Oh man, I you know what I, I would label. If, if you're pulling in 300 feet or 290 feet of cable, label it every two feet. <laughs> okay, get out of salesman mode, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, again, if, if you follow the standards, right, uh, the ANSI standards, uh, EIA, TIA, 606 D now, right, um, it, it's going to tell you what needs to be labeled in there. And then there's some stuff that, you know, you should be labeling, uh, on top of that, but obviously uh, your your rack and row position, all right, need to be labeled. Uh, your patch panels need to be labeled, all right. Uh, on the back side, your cables need to be labeled, all right. Uh, your face plates or workstation outlets need to be labeled. Now, it, it, one of the things that you it, it, it is I recommend, I highly recommend, is behind the face plate or workstation outlet to label that. Um, if, if, uh, sometimes you get lucky and if you put a label on during your, um, your initial pull or your rough in, you may get lucky. Um, again, I, I would recommend that, uh, it doesn't say that you absolutely have to do that, but again, I'd recommend that. Um, let's see what else. Oh, uh, grounding bonding. You have to, oh, don't forget about grounding bonding. Whoo, boy. <laughs> You, you talk about some liability right there. Make sure it's labeled. And again, there's guidelines in uh, the standards that will tell you how to do that. Uh, fire stop. Fire stop. Got to label it. You talk about a huge liability, right, in fire stop. So uh, please label, again, your fire stop. It's all laid out there for you. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, please let me know. In fact, I'm working with a couple of fire stop uh, companies right now to, to really educate them on uh, the standards and and how it should be labeled uh, correctly. Uh, let's say if you're in a data center, uh, you're going to label your grids uh, on the ceiling. Um, man, what am I forgetting, Chuck? Uh, grounding, bonding. I think uh, you covered bonding. almost everything. I, I had to mute yeah. my mic for a second because my dog was barking. Um, well, that was your. I thought that was mine. I, no, saw, no, I honestly mine. thought it was mine. <laughs> the, the AC guy's here to do some work on the AC unit, so. He must have okay. been driving up the driveway. So the, my my protector 
Let him know yeah. that uh, you're not supposed to be on the property. <laughs> Good for you. Yeah, I think, I, think I, I, I think I covered everything. You did. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I would I would say um, it doesn't hurt to overlabel at times. Again, it's um, these days it's more of a CYA. Right. All right. It's a liability thing. Uh, you know, you, you're helping the the IT manager, the the data center manager, uh, the facilities manager. Um, you know, but again, that's uh, as far as the standards are concerned, that's what you need to label. I do want to expand on the fire stop labeling, though, because some people might get confused when you buy a fire stop system. Just happen to have one sitting here at my desk. <laughs> I'm not sure why I have one on my desk, but I do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, a lot of times it comes with a label yeah. and on that label, they want you to put the date it was installed, the company installed that stuff. You're not talking about that label. You're talking about an additional label Correct. on the fire stop, which gives that fire stop a unique alphanumeric identifier. Absolutely. So if someone says there's a problem with this particular fire stop. You can go to exactly that fire stop. So I just want to make sure that was clarified because I don't want people thinking that the label that comes, you, you, should, you should use both. Because that one label, the UL, the, the UL inspector, pff, the electrical inspector is going to be looking for that one label, right? But the customer is going to want the other label. Well, one know. of the things, and real quick, Chuck, is that you 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 brought it up first. Is that yeah, when when you open up that uh, that fire stop, there are going to be those labels, and there is that one label that has you know installed by and dates installed. But again, you could potentially be going back to shaky right. with the sharpie putting his name and putting, you know, whatever date, um, you know, again, I would highly recommend in addition, you know, if you have a handheld labeler, print off a label to put over that little section right there to where it's legible. And, and that's one of the things I'm working on uh, some with, with some of these manufacturers uh, is to uh, put a template inside our machines to where uh, it's got all the pertinent information that that label inside the box gives you, but now you can manually enter some alphanumeric uh, into that. But again, you also need to label in another label in accordance with, uh, again, a unique identifier like uh, you brought up before, Chuck. Yeah, I just want to make sure I, I clarified that because yep. I could just see some people getting confused over that, right? Now, let's talk about cost. You mentioned it, you and I kind of talked about it briefly. Mm -hmm. Not talking about because with a label, you got the labor side and the material side. The labor side, I wouldn't ask you to give a number for that because it depends on union or non-union, whether it's New York City mm -hmm. or Tallahassee, mm -hmm. Florida. You know, there's mm -hmm. a lot of different labor rates out there. Mm -hmm. But material wise, how much does it cost for a, for a uh, for a contractor to generate one label? Well, if you use brother, it's between four to five cents. And so, again, if you're talking raw materials, what you what I would highly recommend if you're a contractor is to go out and and as you're bidding this job and deciding whether you're going to use brother or one of my competitors, take a look at that raw cost. You know, every every cassette tape and I thought I had one sitting here, but every any every cassette tape we have has a marathon of tape. It's twenty six point two feet of, of tape. And, you know, if if that uh, uh, cat six a. Uh, by the way, I saw some of that slim uh, Cat 6 the other day. Oh, yeah. The reduced oh. ID Cat 6A? It's yeah. like 0. 0.23. It's oh. close to Cat 5E. Well, the coolest thing about that sitting with a contractor is that I, I printed off uh, a Cat 6A label and almost wrapped it twice around there. So there are industry guidelines as far as the overlap of the label. All right. Um, mm -hmm. And so I went ahead and printed off a Cat 5 label and what that meant to the contractor is his raw cost uh now is is lower because he can actually get more labels out of that 26.2 right. feet than than before so i mean if you do the math you can do roughly 314 labels out of one of my cassettes you you uh, divide that into what you got from your uh, distribution partner what you purchased it and there's your cost uh versus sheet labeling uh, we're a lot less. I can tell you that right now versus uh, our competitors cassettes. We're a lot less. So again, if you're doing uh, a big data center, I'm, I'm working on a couple of big projects in, in Vegas right now. And uh, I went to the contractor and we did exactly what we're talking about right now. And our cost was about 50% lower than what he initially uh, wanted to use. All right. 
And so we got the job based upon that. And we're talking about 160,000 labels wow. or cables, cables, wow. which you're talking about 320,000 labels or something like that. Right. Those are a lot of nickels, man. Yeah, they versus are. Dimes, versus dimes with our competitors. Right. So again, just do you, do you, do, 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 <laughs> do that do that and um again it, it all depends on what you're buying that from uh through your distribution partner we had a toddism on the let's talk cabling podcast i like it i like it so oh, you're boy. in a unique position right because you've a you've been a contractor now b in your current role you're meeting with contractors you're meeting with customers you're getting to see both sides of this coin mm -hmm. from a customer's perception which is better for their point of view? Is it machine generated or is it handwritten? I still run into both. Um, you know, and, and, and when I run into those companies, Chuck, that, that still are, you know, using the handwritten, I bring up shaky, <laughs> you know, and, and they don't think of that. And, and they don't think of, of all the stuff we just talked about, about, you know, you can't read a label. And so you got to tone it and tag it. Then you got to relabel it with a machine generated, even though that labor's already been done one time, you know, with, with a handwritten label. So again, I, I, but there are contractors out there. They're still doing that. And it's right. just about education and because they don't know how much money they're wasting. All right. So the vast majority of the contractors, I would say 98 uh, percent, you know, don't you know, don't stick. The, 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 well, 98.5 percent <laughs> are, are using machine generated labels. All right. There still are a few out there using um, handwritten labels or just using the Sharpies. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just about what, what you're doing and what you're spreading and what I'm doing and what I'm spreading uh, is is just you know, BS and, and the BS basically uh, is, is, is brother solutions. And, and, you know, it, it comes with education and once they get educated, they're a big fan. They're a big fan. So yeah, to I answer you, I would say to answer your question, Chuck, the vast majority are using machine generated. Um, my, again, my, my, my real question was not the contractor. What's the customer perception when, cause you're dealing with customers too. Uh, Right. Oh, so you may have, you may have to add all that something out. hand labeled or handwritten versus something that's machine generated. Is there is there a customer perception difference there? No, oh, they hate it. Oh, it's you know what it's sloppy. So if I'm if I'm an end user customer, facility manager, data center manager, IT manager, uh, it, it, if if they see that, chances are that contractor who did it will never be called back. I can tell you right now. If they. they <laughs> They hate it. It's the detail, the, the attention to detail to the small things, right? If you're if you're going to be labeling the, the the patch panel on the front, labeling the cable in the back with machine generated labels, labeling the cable behind the faceplate, like you said earlier, and labeling the faceplate. And here's one that you didn't mention, and I, I think this is actually in the TDMM. I think. Wait, wait. It, you know what? I think I know what you're going to say. Do you want? Do you want? You want to do it? Okay, cool. Let's see if you got it. A reverse patch panel label? No. No. No, 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 no. Nice try. Nice try. Um, Damn it. Patch cords for Mutoas. Oh, yeah. The, the TDMM says, says recommends, and I guess I have to go back and double check and verify because I'm pretty sure it does, that it recommends you label both sides of the patch cord for mm -hmm. a Mutoa. One mm -hmm. side, tell it's going to tell you what work service it goes to, and then on the work service side, that should tell you which port on the Mutoa that it goes to because you can't tag and identify that patch cord through you know, 20, 25 feet of modular furniture. I don't care how right. good you think you are, right? The other thing to consider too, and you brought up a real good point, is that I'm real big in asset management. And, um, you know, the, there's there's a, a finite amount of information for, let's say, 606D. You know, it's, it's based upon certain things. But let's just hypothetically say that the customer uh, is using 606D, but wants to throw in some of his own, Okay. Um, and this is particularly true in data centers. So what I am recommending is QR codes for asset management. And again, on a QR code, you can get 7,400 pieces of information, either alpha or numeric. But if you can co combine them, 
you get over 4,000 pieces of information. So imagine you're in a data center and, you know, you, you have a bad cable. Well, that cable is, is probably going through four or five different uh, server cabinets or racks or so forth and whatnot. So I'm working with data centers right now to develop a system to where a tech can walk up to a cable uh, using a micro QR code. And it's got uh, all of the information on there as far as a 606D. But once they scan that, it can bring up a map and basically show you exactly where that cable is if you're in you know, uh, row A, rack one, port one, it's going to basically say it, it hops here, hops there, hops there, and ends up over in row H. So you brought up a good point as far as, you know, uh, labeling the, the patch cables. I mean, I, I think you should label them too, every patch cable out there, right? But uh, I don't see a lot of that. But using QR codes uh, is, is a huge help if that customer wants to add more information, and it's mainly for uh, asset management. What I was talking about, and, and this is something that's a long uh, lost uh, art, yeah, but I did it all the time because I wanted to go above and beyond uh, my competition. But when you're on the backside of that patch panel, um, I did a reverse patch panel label on the backside. And, and for an IT manager to come in and, and not only be able to identify all the ports uh, in, in the front based upon 606A labeling, or a D now, um, but the ability to go back and troubleshoot and see the same labeling on the back side of that patch panel. And all it is is a reverse patch panel. And so again, that's a long lost art. You don't have to do it, but if you're a contractor that wants to go above and beyond uh, whoever was there before you or retain services down the road, it's just something to think about. Even even if not from a customer's perspective, right? As a, as a technician in the field, I mean, I've had the service the backside of patch panels before. You look at it on the front, you walk around the back, and you're off by one or off by another row. And you're like, oh, and you can walk back around again. It saves yep. you time as a as a service tech. Yeah, time, absolutely. As you know, is is money. It's absolutely <laughs> is money. Yeah. Oh, so, man. brother Todd, I appreciate having you on today. I will put yeah. links in the comments below for your show and and your LinkedIn profile and your email and your name of your firstborn child even what kind of motorcycle you ride in case somebody wants to go ride <laughs> it's getting kind of cold out here so i i've i put her in for the winter yeah, it is it, Please. it's you know what it's it's getting it's into the 70s now you know so uh oh. anyway uh no. <laughs> well, thanks for having me i appreciate your support thank you very much uh if anyone has any questions uh chuck can provide uh, my contact information i certainly will that's it for this episode of today's podcast. We hope you were able to learn something. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on future content. Also, leave a rating so we can help even more people learn about telecommunications. Until next time, be safe.